this war is of existential importance for Russia. Either it uh, protects its national security interest in Ukraine and uh, more widely in, in Europe's east, uh, or the future of Russia will be very bleak. Hello and welcome to the G Zero World podcast. This is where you'll find extended versions of my interviews on public television. And today we are talking about the view of the war in Ukraine from Moscow. After more than a year of grueling warfare, massive casualties and equipment losses with little to show for it, what are Russia's goals heading into the Ukrainian counteroffensive? Is there any hope for resolution in a conflict the Kremlin describes as an existential battle with NATO for the future of the country? I'm talking about all this and more with Dmitry Trenin. He's a former colonel in the Russian army and former director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. We spoke hours before Wagner Group head Yevgeny Prigozhin launched his brief armed rebellion against the Russian military, a crisis that represented the single most brazen challenge to the Kremlin's authority in post-Soviet Russia. And the fact that a former Russian intelligence officer and Putin ally didn't see Prigozhin as a challenge just hours before the attempted coup raises a lot of questions about whether the Russian president's grip on power is as strong as previously believed. And one more note before we begin. Trenin has rebranded himself as a hardliner for the war since the invasion began, and some listeners might find what he says alarming or factually wrong. I think you can handle it. I don't endorse his opinions, but I know it's important to hear candid views from the Russian perspective so we can all better understand possible outcomes or paths to compromise. Let's get to it. The G Zero World podcast is brought to you by our lead sponsor, Prologis. Prologis helps businesses across the globe scale their supply chains with an expansive portfolio of logistics real estate and the only end-to-end -end solutions platform addressing the critical initiatives of global logistics today. Learn more at prologis.com. Dimitri Trenin, thanks so much for joining us on G Zero World. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you for having me. So you're, I mean, since the war has started uh, back last year in February, uh, you're the first guest I've had from Russia. And I'm very interested to have a chance to chat with you about your perspective uh, on the war and the implications globally. I uh, salute you for breaking the ice. I think we need it. Let me start uh, with where we are right now. Um, I mean, I saw Putin giving a speech, uh, taking some questions from some military bloggers uh, in the past weeks, uh, talking about, you know, not some ammunition challenges, uh, fighting challenges. I mean, one, it seemed like he was uh, less upbeat uh, than I have seen him publicly before. Um, and also, of course, we are at the beginnings of this Ukrainian counteroffensive. Um, how do you think the war is, from, from Russia's perspective, how is the war going? Well, I think that the war is, uh, has taken on a, um, a character of, um, of a war of attrition. So I think most people here expect the... Uh, hostilities to last uh, a while, maybe a long while. The war is not seen as one between Russia and Ukraine proper. Rather, it's seen as a war between Russia and the U.S.-led collective West with Ukraine, the tip of the spear. And um, I, I, I don't think that the early expectations uh, uh, of a quick uh, and decisive victory survive in any quarters now here in, in Russia. But um, I think most people believe that uh, Russia will uh, ultimately prevail. Uh, the issue is at what cost, uh, uh, how long it would take, what sort of an effort would be also needed inside the country to what extent uh, Russia will mobilize its uh, resources to fight the war. Uh, most people over the last 16 months have learned to adapt to a very strange reality of a major war being waged with, uh, I think, uh, outwardly, uh, the country looking very much the same. 
Uh, you uh, go to Moscow, you go to St. Petersburg, you go to smaller cities and towns across the country, and uh, life is, uh, by and large, as, as it used to be. There is normalcy all around you. But at the same time, you switch on TV sets and, uh, uh, and you hear uh, stories about uh, attacks, counterattacks, casualties, artillery shelling, uh, also civilians dying, part of Russia's own territory being uh, subjected to shelling and uh, refugees resulting from that. So there are all sorts of things uh, that uh, are very new and uh, and unexpected, I should say. But uh, this is all wrapped in a, in a general um, veneer of normalcy. It's true, certainly, that the Russian economy has not collapsed and a lot of the early expectations of the West that the sanctions would have, have not played out uh, in terms of the way the Russian economy is functioning. But at the same time, I mean, a lot of Russians have been killed. A lot of Russians have been injured. Hundreds of thousands of Russians have been sent into the fight. Young men, uh, of course, more than that have fled the country. Uh, as we saw to Georgia, to other, you know, sort of border crossings. I mean, you know, this speaks of an awful lot of families and communities that are suffering um, because life isn't normal in that very real way. I'm, I'm sure that you didn't mean that when you said that it feels normal. How, how are people responding to that aspect of the war? Well, I think, again, it, uh, it very much depends on whether you have someone, a member of the family on the front line or... If you don't, um, I think that those who um, who have their family members out there uh, fighting uh, or or in the forces uh, close to the line of uh, to the front line, uh, you will be uh, very concerned about what's happening. You'll be very very concerned about your loved ones. Um, on the other hand, if um, you're not uh, in that category, then uh, you know in in places like Moscow, you um, you don't really feel that uh, uh, a lot of people are focused primarily on the war. People go about their business uh, on a daily basis, and uh, people are planning holidays uh, in wherever Turkey, uh, Egypt, the Maldives, uh, uh, people who can afford that. Other people are worried about, let's say, less expensive things. In some other localities, um, there's a, a larger number of uh, younger people and uh, middle-aged people who've, uh, who've either been uh, mobilized in this partial mobilization or have uh, uh, signed a um, uh, contract with the defense ministry and are volunteer, volunteered to fight. Uh, they uh, receive uh, pretty substantial benefits, which helps their families, which helps the uh, uh, the communities, and um, and there I should say the level of uh, patriotism uh, could be even higher than among the people who are not affected by the war directly. So it's a very mixed picture. You, you, you suggested um, that uh, Russia feels like they are fighting against NATO. And I mean, of course, we're not talking about NATO troops on the ground in Ukraine, but I assume you mean the intelligence support, the military support, the training, all of that. Do you think that Putin was aware before he made the decision to invade on February 24th that he was going to be fighting? against NATO. Did he expect that level of support of Ukraine from the United States and its allies? My guess, based on uh, on the public uh, publicly available information, Putin's own statements, the concept of the special military operation as it appears to outside observers, I don't think that uh, initially uh, there was much expectation of uh, any sort of fighting. There was also some expectation, I think, that um, what the, what used to be called uh, uh, healthy forces within Ukraine, say the pro-Russian element in the Ukrainian uh, political class, would use this opportunity to to actually topple the 
Zelensky government and come to power and then welcome Russian forces and uh, uh, and relying uh, uh, on the support of the of the uh, of the bulk of the Ukrainian army uh, who would be fighting uh, the uh, nationalist battalions such as the Azov and then some of the others. It's a far cry clearly from uh, what emerged and uh, Putin you would recall that uh, within weeks after uh, the start of the military oper- the special military operation, uh, when uh, I think he realized that things were not uh, going according to plan, he uh, engaged uh, the Ukrainians in uh, peace negotiations. These the negotiations started in March, first in uh, Belarus uh, and then in Turkey. And by late March, early April, uh, a treaty was ready, was initialed even, that was supposed to end the war. And I should tell you that by that time, any talk of peace after Russia had already suffered a few thousand people um, as casualties in that war, uh, that uh, idea of peace was uh, pretty unpopular in Russian society. And yet Putin was very much behind it. I mean, more, more and that unpopular. That peace was not concluded. That, more that, un- that peace was not uh, finalized because of the intervention from the United States and the United Kingdom. M- more. did not, in my view, want to yeah. leave uh, Putin off the hook. I mean, that's that's contested, of course. Uh, I mean, well, in, in, I'm talking in, yeah. about the way it's it's seen here. It's, you know, I know, and I think it's important for people to understand what the Russians are hearing domestically. I really do. I mean, of course, you know, you didn't mention that um, that the Ukrainians had experienced far more deaths and casualties, including civilian deaths and casualties in that war um, at that point. And so the idea that the Ukrainians, having just been invaded, would support a peace uh, it also from a political perspective, the amount of pressure far greater uh, on Zelensky than possibly would have been on Putin at the time. You said that you, the Russia views itself as fighting against NATO. Russia, of course, is largely fighting by itself. Um, I mean, even you know, close countries like Kazakhstan um, have tried to play a more independent role, even after Russia provided thousands of troops to help uh, defend uh, the Kazakh president months before. Um, China, uh, a very close partner of Russia, providing no military support at all for a Russian military that badly needs it. Again, Putin said publicly just a few weeks ago that they need more military capacity. China not providing it. Only Iran really providing significant support because, of course, the Iranians are already sanctioned very heavily by the West. They have less to lose. Um, I mean, do, is how how disappointing is it for Russia that, I mean, in this war that, that you're suggesting the Russians are perfectly legitimate in fighting and they're fighting against all of NATO, that Russia has to fight basically by itself? Well, I think it's taken as a fact, and um, there was no expectation of Russia's uh, formal allies in the collective security treaty organization, such as Kazakhstan and, and some of the others, to join Russia in that fight. In fact, the only country that uh, gives Russia material support in that war among its uh, allies is Belarus. And that's all. Uh, yep. There was no no real expectation of China uh, joining Russia in that fight because um, it is uh, accepted here that China uh, is its own, uh, its own man, if you like, its own master, and will only yeah. engage... In a way that China Belarus is interest. not. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, Belarus is, is a close ally. We have a union state with Belarus, and uh, uh, it's not just a phrase. Uh, the amount of the degree of integration between Belarus and Russia is also in defense and security is, is, is formidable. Uh, China is so certainly a superpower, and China will do what 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 is in China's interest. Engaging uh, in in a proxy war against the United States uh, on the side of uh, of of Russia is certainly not believed to be in China's interest. But uh, China has been um, um, uh, has been an important uh, source of um, of. Um, Various uh, materials, uh, civilian materials, and when uh, Russia's trade with the European Union, its largest uh, economic 
partner collapsed virtually. Uh, China picked up uh, part of that. Uh, again, acting out of its own interest, not out of any favor to Russia. Russia is not expe- expecting favors from anyone. So that, that's uh, it's not sne- not seen as disappointing, but rather it's seen as Russia being uh, being uh, well. The word punished is 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 wrong here, but Russia being ganged up against because of its uh, uh, because of its determination to um, uh, to protect and defend its own national interest. That's how it seems. But given that Russia is essentially fighting by itself with Belarus against, you know, the most powerful military actors in the world, you know, d- doesn't this imply that the Russian leadership needs to have a sense of reality? Um, for its own people, for its own survival, for its own long-term perspectives, and therefore needs to be more modest about what it thinks it can actually accomplish? Well, Ian, I think that the Russian uh, leadership and the bulk of the Russian people have a sense of history. So this is not the first time that Russia is uh, is being confronted by, uh, let's say, the combined forces of the West. This is the first time, however, that Russia has... uh, No allies in the West. We had allies in both uh, 1812 and and 1941 wars, in Britain in the first case, and the United States and Britain in the other in the other one. This time, the entire West is against Russia. That is ascribed to the um, to the success of U.S. foreign policy, to the success of U.S. call it call it hegemony, call it dominance, call it leadership, whatever you want to call it. The United States has the power, and it has shown that power, to mobilize uh, the West against Russia. On the other hand, the countries of Europe have moved against Russia, such countries such as Germany, even against their own uh, uh, best uh, economic interests. And that is another very new factor that, yep. uh, that that people have noted here. It's a very big challenge for Russia. And uh, I think this uh, supports the thesis that this war is of existential importance for Russia. Either it uh, protects its national security interest in, uh, um, in, in Ukraine and uh, more widely in, in Europe's east, uh, or... Um, the future of Russia will be very bleak. I mean, Russia has lost a lot of credibility, right? I mean, uh, there was a belief among American defense analysts and NATO defense analysts that once the Russians invaded, they would be able to roll over Ukraine very quickly. They were wrong. Um, They saw the incompetence. They saw um, the, the inadequacy of Russian defense forces, and that made the Russians look very weak. They see now um, Mr. Prigozhin running the Wagner Group on the ground in Ukraine um, and basically cursing the Russian defense minister and the head of the regular armed forces of Russia on an almost daily basis. If from the West's perspective, he looks like a lunatic, but he also looks anti-patriotic. First of all, uh, is Prigozhin or his rants, are they, do they get any play inside Russian media at all? Are the Russian people aware of them? What do the Russians need to do to not look so incredibly weak on the global stage? Well, they need to win. They need to win that war in Ukraine. And um, if you like, defeat, well, the combined forces of the West in Ukraine. Uh, That's that's the only path to uh, winning back credibility in the West. Uh, with regard to uh, Prigozhin, his statements, comments, what have you, are widely disseminated through the uh, network of uh, telegram channels. They are not on the evening news every day, but the uh, achievements of the Wagner Group are, are recognized publicly. Prigozhin himself is not very much on the in, in the official news, but as I said, most people get their news, their analyses from uh, virtually dozens and hundreds of independent telegram channels, and they report on Prigozhin's statements uh, often. I think that, um, again, this is my own guess, that Prigozhin has the latitude that he enjoys because 
because the president, the commander in chief, wants to keep the defense ministry on its toes. He wants to have some internal patriotic um, debate or uh, at least people checking on, on one another. And that's why he meets with the war correspondents who also have very often very unorthodox views and views that are not uh, in line with what the, uh, the, uh, the official uh, is reporting to the president. The president comes from the intel community. And right. the intel community, you need several sources uh, to uh, get a, a wider, a, more, a fuller picture of any situation. And he uses that. Politically, I don't think it matters. Uh, the idea that somehow Prigozhin is, uh, is a challenge to Putin is just ludicrous. So that's what it is. And I would say that initially you would... You, you would recall what I was saying when I was commenting on the special military operation. It was certainly more, much more special than military. Putin was not preparing to fight. He was preparing, I think, to, uh, to deter, to, uh, you know, to give backing to the internal Ukrainian forces who would, uh, who would rise up to the occasion and, uh, you know, do uh, the, the toppling of the regime in Kiev, that, that sort of thing. And, and make place for 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 a replacement regime. Russia did not start the war with a shock and awe, although it had the it had the capability of doing that. Uh, there's no question that Russia could have bombed Kiev and could have eliminated the the headquarters of the yeah. Ukrainian military, the headquarters of the Ukrainian uh, intel service. Could have switched off Ukrainian television. Would have uh, could have. Uh, blown up the bridges uh, across the. Well, they were they were they were like massive. Many things, and they were they were massive you know, they cyber were attacks. Done. They were massive cyber right. attacks that largely yeah, failed. Well, that's, exactly. It's certainly true that Russia did not try to destroy Kiev; it tried to take it, um, and it failed. I I do think it's interesting that I mean Russian deterrence no longer seems to stand up to um, the Americans, the Europeans, others providing longer range missiles, F-16s, all of these things. I I have seen uh, growing levels of uh, saber rattling, nuclear saber rattling from people like former Premier President Medvedev, some from President Putin himself. And I'm wondering how you think about the Russian nuclear force slash deterrent, the largest in the world, and the role that it does or should play. Well, I think that uh, one of the surprises of this, uh, of this entire conflict was uh, the uh, uh, inability of uh, Russia's uh, nuclear deterrent to keep the United States from intervening uh, in a proxy conflict, in a proxy war, in an area of uh, utmost strategic importance to Russia. Ukraine is a huge place. It's, uh, it's the largest country in Europe outside of yeah. Russia. It's a country that is led by a virulently anti-Russian regime, which which has been in existence since uh, 2014. This conflict and did not certainly start, much more so now. Uh, this uh, conflict started eight years back or nine years back, and uh, it's been uh, a conflict, uh, uh, low level, low intensity conflict, waged uh, mostly in eastern Ukraine and. Uh, Putin's uh, attempts to somehow uh, deal with the situation um, in Donbass through diplomatic means was uh, essentially uh, re revealed as, uh, as futile as uh, former President Hollande and former Chancellor Merkel basically stated that they uh, did not mean uh, uh, through the Minsk agreement, uh, did not mean to... Um, to proceed toward a solution. Rather, that was a time-winning gimmick to uh, help Ukraine build a strong military. So basically, yes, uh, Ukraine uh, is, uh, is a very, uh, is, is, is actually uh, a very serious, as we all know today, a very serious military, military power. Led, uh, led by uh, a virulently anti-Russian regime.
Again, as the Russians in the Donbass were claiming that there were no Russian forces that were ordered there or fighting there, I mean, again, the level of misinformation that was going on in terms of the fighting on the ground since 2014 in the Donbass has been significant. Uh, relatively equivalent numbers of casualties on both sides, all of those things. This uh, conflict uh, did not start uh, out of the blue on the 24th of February. It has at least a nine-year history preceding it. And, uh, and if you look back uh, um, uh, a decade before that, uh, you, you, you can see that uh, uh, this whole business of Ukraine being uh, um, invited to NATO, being uh, condition with the elite being uh, drawn into the Western camp. Uh, this was a challenge that essentially no Russian leadership would have would have been able to tolerate. So again, the Ukrainians should not a country should not have a sovereign right to decide which strategic alliances it wishes to be a part of. That's that's the perspective. Look, uh, when uh, when the Ukrainian leadership was. Uh, uh, in negotiating uh, NATO membership for Ukraine, the idea of NATO membership was supported by a minority within Ukraine. And yet the leadership uh, was very much pushing that forward. Now, again, uh, various countries can take uh, various leaderships and various countries can take various decisions. But right. each decision carries a price. And that, that applies to Russia, that applies to the United States, that applies to Ukraine. And uh, what I see today, and what worries me most today, is that the trajectory of the Ukraine crisis, you talked about uh, Western uh, involvement, Western support, uh, all the way from the javelins to the F-16s and, and possibly beyond longer range missiles and all that stuff. I see this trajectory taking us all, and I and I I mean you and me as well, toward a, a direct a military collision between Russia and NATO. And if there is such a collision, then um, you know an exchange, a nuclear exchange between Russia and the United States may not be seen as a fantasy. This is the most dangerous time geostrategically since 1962. I think you and I fundamentally agree on that. Uh, you've also been directly involved in some high level and not reported, at least not, not widely reported, uh, sort of track two, track one and a half discussions between Russians and Americans, uh, trying to see if there might be any way um, to end this confrontation. Uh, have Do you come away with any sense of progress or hope from those discussions so far? Well, I wouldn't characterize them necessarily as either uh, track one and a half or high level, uh, maybe high level in terms of professional experience and, uh, and, and uh, knowledge of things and, uh, and all that. But uh, certainly uh, th there's been no attempt, to my knowledge, uh, between uh, the two countries uh, to start discussing, um, you know, how to end this conflict on terms that would uh, satisfy the uh, the uh, the interests of the respected parties. Uh, I think it's important, though, to keep um, to stay in touch, to keep um, the lines of contact open. For 30 years, we built relationships. Uh, we learned to respect one another. We learned to see and accept the differences uh, that separate us. But we also uh, trust, uh, still trust, I think, many of our colleagues on the other side as, as professionals. There's a limit to what uh, professionals uh, can do, what experts can do. They can offer advice. They can, they can uh, talk more broadly to the uh, to the interested publics. Uh, they can raise important issues, but essentially, decisions are made by uh, by uh, political leaders. And uh, my uh, conclusion as of today is that. Uh, um, uh, 
political leaderships are not uh, are not there yet to uh, think in terms of uh, a new equilibrium uh, and a new geopolitical setup in that part of the world. The U.S. strategy, which is built on Russia being a weakling and um, there being no limits to how much the United States or how far or how high the United States can escalate this conflict, uh, makes me think of a Russian roulette with a nuclear bullet sitting in the revolver. And this gives me a lot of a lot of fear, a lot of concern. I take that very seriously, Dimitri. Uh, that's, again, why I wanted to talk to you. And I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. That's it for today's edition of the G Zero World Podcast. Do you like what you heard? Of course you did. Well, why don't you check us out at g0media.com and take a moment to sign up for our newsletter. It's called G Zero Daily. The G Zero World Podcast is brought to you by our lead sponsor, Prologis. Prologis helps businesses across the globe scale their supply chains with an expansive portfolio of logistics real estate and the only end-to-end solutions platform addressing the critical initiatives of global logistics today. Learn more at prologis.com. You're listening to the G Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.